Again, my name is Sharon Arnicky Aitchison. I've been a Schoharie County resident for most of my life. I graduated from Schoharie Central School in 1969 and Albany Business College in 1971. I worked many years as a medical office assistant and medical secretary in Albany and returned to Schoharie County in 1980 and I've been here back here ever since. I was in my 26th year as a building secretary at the Ryder Elementary School in Cobleskill when I retired in 2007. My husband of 43 years and I have one daughter, Katie. Katie lives in Albany, New York. And prior to that, she lived and taught in Madrid, Spain and Lima, Peru for several years. I have always enjoyed sewing. I remember sitting at my grandmother's knee while she spun at her treadle machine and my interest was peaked in sewing at six years old. Soon after that, I began 4-H and I learned to sew and create. I can actually still remember the box we made covered in fabric and we used um, Mod Podge to seal it and that was our sewing box. I made many of my own clothes when I was in high school and when I was a college student. After that, my wardrobe was mostly uniform, so I soon took an interest in quilting. I would have to say, though, that my best quilting began after I retired in 2007. I had more time, space, and patience to be creative. I'm a member of the Peaceable Day Quilters Guild in, in Cobleskill, New York, and a former member of the Schoharie Valley Peacemakers. I was a founding member and officer of the Schoharie County Quilt Barn Trail, which came into existence in 2012, following Hurricane Irene's devastation to Schoharie County in 2011. So let's explore how quilting evolved. It's not your grandmother's average blanket. Quilters nowadays take for granted the vast array of beautiful fabrics that are available to us and all the quilting tools many of us never even dreamed of when we first began sewing. We're going to take a look at the earliest evidence of quilted items, the necessity of quilts, and move forward to quilts becoming works of art. How did quilt designs even get their names? Is it hand sewn? Is it machine pieced? What would a colonist need a quilt for besides warmth? How did the oldest quilts withstand the wear and tear of use and time? And where are they now? Explore with me some history of quilt making and where we are today with the most intricate designs, fabrics so rich and beautiful, the women of the prairie would weep for them. The word quilt comes from the Latin cosita, stuffed mattress or cushion. While no one seems certain when quilting as we know it began, there's evidence found in Egypt at the temple of Osiris, which reveals that people wore quilted clothing as long as 5,000 years ago. So what is a quilt? In the most basic sense, it is three layers a sandwich, if you will. The bottom slice of bread is a layer of fabric that is called the backing. It's used almost always cotton, and in this day and age, we are able to purchase yards of fabric for backings that are 108 inches wide, rather than have to stitch together lengths of fabric to be large enough to cover the entire back of a queen or king-size quilt. The bologna in this sandwich is the batting. This is usually 100% cotton or wool or polyester or a polycotton blend. The top slice of bread of your quilt sandwich is the pieced quilt top. These three layers are quilted together by machine or hand and that creates the finished quilt. After that, a binding is added around all the outside edges to encase the layers. In days gone by, the batting may have been missing altogether or filled with feathers or down or even chopped up old clothing to fill that layer and add warmth. Quilts are often a piecework of living history, a documentation of an event. Of local interest is the Sharon Springs Methodist Church Quilt. 
the Sharon Historical Society president, who you've just met, Ron Kettleson, received a call from a man in Pennsylvania who said he had a quilt that he believed was from Sharon Springs, New York. He bought it at an auction many years prior in Erie, Pennsylvania, and it was part of an estate of a woman who collected quilts. He believed this might have come from the Methodist Church in Sharon Springs. He told Ron it was embroidered with the names of many members of the congregation, as well as the names of the pastors from the church. Ron did some research and indeed, it was made by the Ladies Aid Society at the Methodist Church in Sharon Springs in the year 1895. The quilt is in impressive condition. Fortunately, the Sharon St Historical Society was able to purchase that quilt and bring it home to Sharon Springs. Once the museum opens again, hopefully this year, they will, they will have that quilt on display. Similarly, many quilts are created through the process of applique, specifically cut shapes, hand stitched to a fabric block, and then embellished with embroidery and hand stitching. Oftentimes, many pieces of fabric, especially wool, are cut into various shapes to form a beautiful object or objects to create a quilt block. The examples shown there were from simple to more elaborate, and now we come to a Baltimore album quilt, where there are multiple blocks, each different one from the other, constructed of hundreds of pieces. There has been documentation that in the days of knights in armor, their armor was constructed of quilted fabrics. A quilt could be a wedding gift. It could be friends and family signing on a piece of fabric. Then that signature is hand embroidered and the fabric set into a block. Dates are embroidered into quilt blocks and give us information that we may otherwise have had to search long and hard to determine the era it was created in. A quilt block may be crafted in such a way that fabric is cut <clears throat> and pieced or appliqued to unravel the story of the person or person's proud events. The, the block that or the quilt that you can see right now on the screen is called a double wedding ring quilt and that would have been done uh, for newlyweds and I see their names are Jamie and Mahak. The quilt may signify proud events as in that wedding, their struggles, war, births, deaths, weddings and many more events. A quilt expresses the passion of the quilter as well. Colors in a quilt are often expressions of the quilter himself or herself. Examples might be the patriotic colors of red, white, and blue, mm -hmm. or a school or college colors for a graduation gift. Symbols in quilts speak to the quilt itself, as well as the creator, and also for whom it is created. The quilt on the screen right now is one that I made for my husband's best friend in England. He asked me if I would make him a quilt with his favorite soccer team logo on it. And there it is. Blocks have been designed with patterns that leave clues. An example on your left is the windmill block. It may indicate a farm or a granary. The tree of life on the right may be made even in a larger size and the names of family members could be embroidered or printed in the lighter uh, blocks, probably also including a date of birth, or they may be, use leaves as applique and add it to the block with the person's name and date of birth on it. Quilting has been sewn into our history as far back as the 17th century when quilts were made as necessities. Hobby quilting came to be as women gathered to pass time in the era of growth of the textile and industry. Large scale factory productions of textiles began in the late 1700s, first in Great Britain, where a cotton spinning frame machine was invented in 1783 by Richard Arkwright. Spinning wheel mills were introduced to the United States in 1790 by English-born machinist and businessman, Samuel Slater. 
In the 50s and 60s, quilting fell out of fashion. Fast forward now to the 1980s and 90s, and women saw the opportunity to learn something new as well as useful. Nowadays, women and men find quilting to be artistic expression as preserving a craft for generations yet to come. A study done in 2017 by the Quilter Company estimated only 1% of the estimated 7 to 10 million quilters are male. I have three friends who are male quilters and their quilts range from simple pieced work to modern to artistic work portraying beautiful pictures through quilting. The tools of the quilter vary often depending upon the sort of quilting a person enjoys. The basics weren't always there. Pins, for example, were made from brass and tin plate in the 17th century. The head of a pin was a piece of wire wrapped around the shank. Those generally were from England until a needle manufacturer was established in the colonies during the Revolution era. Fancy trying to shove that pin through layers of fabric. Mm -hmm. The thimble was an important tool to aid the sewist as well, to help her push that pin or a needle through layers of fabric. It was actually a piece of body armor, protective gear for her. Early thimbles were heavy, stubby cylinders. There was a metal end on the thimble to, thimble to allow the sewist to push the needles and the pins without damaging her finger or thumb. Today, there are still metal thimbles, but also the hybrids of leather, plastic, jelly, the one on the far right, which is my personal preference. Shears and scissors were also more available in the colonies with the revolutionary era. Prior to that, they were from England, the best being of Sheffield steel. In 17th century England, Quilted doublets and breeches, certainly reserved only for the most wealthy people, became popular. In India, they created bed covers from chintz. It was a painted and dyed cotton, but certainly the most popular quilts were domestic, created, created for everyday use in a home out of necessity. Yet other quilts marked those special occasions, births, weddings, funerals, people moving west, and could also be part of a dowry. Early American colonists brought linen and wool with them from Europe. From this grew the need to raise sheep for wool and flax for linen. With cotton available from the south and the creation of the cotton gin, spinning tools and looms evolved and fabric became more available, as did yarn and thread. Fabrics were still imported from England, China, and India. Dyes were created from plants and animals, which was both a science and an art. As we think about colonial America and quilting, we recall a harsh and unforgiving era. Homes were primitive, just cabins. They offered minimal protection from the elements. Food was scarce, their diets were very poor, and illness often took lives at young ages. The Puritan religion was influential and most women were not taught to read. If she was taught to read at all, it would be just enough for her to be able to read the Bible. Even fewer were taught to write. It was believed to be an option only for men. Women were raised to be subservient first to their fathers and then to their husbands. A woman was expected to spin wool, sew, preserve what food they had, clean and look after the children and her mate. Chances are she had a very large family. With no elect electricity, she would sew by hand in the nights, probably with just a little light from a candle and the fire in the hearth. Their handwork was probably done May through November as women would gather their children round them and tell stories she did her handwork. As they prepared for overland journeys, women would need to consider the food, clothing, bedding, and the men would need to consider what animals and form of travel would go along with them. 
the woman would want to do a great deal of sewing prior to departure. There would be two or three quilts for each of the people in the party. They may need one to sit upon for cushioning as they traveled days through rough terrain. By night, a quilt would be to divide off a space, sleep under, and form barriers from harsh weather. Fabrics were very precious. Nothing could be wasted. Quilts may be created from the bits of clothing that were still good enough to reuse in creating some patchwork. A quilt may also be created from the clothing of a beloved family member who had passed on. There was much storytelling around the quilt frame. Neighboring farm wives would gather to hand quilt while their men folk were raising a barn or helping to bring in a crop. They worked together. The children would gather under the quilt, and if you were a really lucky one, you might be engaged to poke the needle back up through the quilt to the quilter. This was the woman's social life. After the men had finished their work, great meals were created for all, and everyone pitched in with a dish of their own. A quilt can warm a person in many ways. It warms the creator as she ponders each stitch and what it means to her and the person that she's making it for. And it warms the recipient. Quilts were used in other ways than on the bed. Often while crossing the prairie, the weather was unbearable. Quilts would likely be used to put across the open ends of their wagons to ward off the harsh winds. They may also be used as walls to divide cabins for sleeping, keeping the fire's warmth closer to the sleepers. As spring approached, the pioneer women may lay their quilts out on the fresh snow to clean and hang them on airs to line, to line dry. Babies were born along the trail to the west and medical, medical care was just not available. Often injuries were left untreated people died from disease and infection. Graves have been found where the deceased was wrapped in a handmade quilt for their burial. As the pioneers reached their destinations, their quilts were still a warm and loving treasure, giving them connection to what they had left behind. Their quilts may then be incorporated in their new homes, some as decoration or to cover the cutouts for windows that beloved quilt helped there too. The first practical sewing machine arrived in 1846, a mere 175 years ago. Evidence shows quilting goes back 5,000 years. In 1830, a French tailor named Bartholomew Thimener patented a machine using a hooked and barbed needle. He was given a contract to produce uniforms for the French army. It is of credit to the family-owned sewing machine business, Bernina, who since 1893 have been making high-end, wonderful sewing machines, and it continues to this day. A little backstory on the Singer sewing machine takes us to a local town, Cooperstown, New York. Edward Cabot Clark, an attorney born in Athens, New York, which is in Greene County, met Isaac Merritt Singer in 1849. He advised Mr. Singer in the naming and patent of his invention, the sewing machine. It was the first to form a chain stitch. Singer assigned Clark three eighths of the patent, apparently in lieu of the legal fees he could not afford. Mr. Singer died in 1875, and Mr. Clark returned to the company and guided it to greater success as its president from 1875 until his retirement in 1882. Clark came to Cooperstown and purchased parcels of land and settled there. He died in October of 1882, and many properties in Cooperstown still bear the Clark name to this day. Patterns became available to women with the publishing of women's magazines and newspapers. By the late 1800s, catalog sales began to include quilt patterns. If a woman ordered yardage from Sears or Montgomery Ward, 
she would purchase a pattern for as little as a dime. In the 1800s, there was an isolated and rural community in Gee's Bend, Alabama. Excuse me for a second. Sorry, I needed water. <clears throat> The isolated rural community of G's Bend, where enslaved women began quilting using discarded goods. Their quilts were necessary, practical, and they provided warmth for their families. But in their unexpected way, the quilters of G's Bend created non-traditional quilts with abstract designs depicting their culture, their experience, and their artistry. Their never before seen quilts expressed incredible passion and emotion. Gee's Bend is a tiny community located in a large bend of the Alabama River. Due to its geographic isolation, Gee's Bend was left to itself for over a hundred years after the Civil War. The Freedom Quilting Bee was established there in 1966 during the Civil Rights Movement. It became a way for these African-American women to gain independence from G's Bend through the income of selling their quilts. And every time I read this, I get goosebumps. <clears throat> they didn't leave. They stayed, choosing to remain and continue their lives that they loved. They're very religious people. They sing gospels to ward off their low days, and they sing and sew their way through their quilts. The works of the G's Bend women was displayed first in Texas, then New York, and then a Milwaukee museum. The ladies, many of whom had never even left their G's Bend roots, were invited to go and be a part of the display of quilts. Its many traditions, including quilting, remain unchanged into the 21st century. If you go to youtube.com, you will find particular interesting um, videos of these ladies. Just type in their search bar, the quilt makers of G's Bend. You'll get quite a few hits and each of the, um, the videos is very, very enjoyable and surely speaks to this culture. <clears throat> I would personally love to sit beside any or all of these beautiful souls and hear their stories while watching them quilt. Today, we're very fortunate to have good tools, making quilting so much more enjoyable and simpler to perform, to perform perfect cuts that fit well and precisely together like a puzzle. There are specialty rulers, templates, rotary cutters and cutting mats, needle threaders, electronic and computerized sewing machines, many of which sew at speeds of 1500 stitches per minute or more. There's a sewing machine for everyone out there from the most basic single straight mm -hmm. stitch to machines with dozens and dozens of built-in fancy stitches, utility stitches, presser feet that change in the blink of an eye, zipper attachments, button <laughs> holders, blind hem stitchers, and almost anything else you could imagine, including embroidery. You can pay $150 to $200 for a very decent basic machine or upwards of eight to $10,000. <laughs> When you get into industrial machines and a long arm machine, as you see in the slide here, those prices can easily double. Not every sewist will own a long arm. They start in the $10,000 bracket and go up from there. They also take up a pretty large piece of real estate since they set up from eight feet to 12 feet in length. Some are all hand guided. Others, like the one you see here with the laptop attached to it, are computer guided. Quilting, regardless of your skill level or the number of gadgets and machines you own, is still a labor of love. Thus, the emotional warmth of creating a quilt. It is a resourceful outlet for creativity. Today's quilters have so many choices. Perhaps it's her mother's or her grandmother's old treadle or her mother's Singer Featherweight, built in the 30s through the 50s. I have to inject a little story here, Ron. That little black thing, uh, Singer Featherweight that you see there on the right, my mother owned one of those. It was a pretty prized possession, and my sister is its keeper now. 
But that machine sewed like a dream. When I was in college, I my boyfriend invited me to go to a family event where he was going to be the godfather to a new nephew. Well, I knew I had to have something proper to wear. And being a struggling college student, paying to put myself through college, I knew I couldn't go buy something off the hanger. So I bought some fabric and a pattern and I borrowed my mother's little featherweight. Got it back to my apartment at college, cut out my dress and I can still see it. It was mint green um, dotted Swiss with tiny little blue roses in it. Got the machine set up ready to sew and there was no presser foot. So I had no throttle. I didn't know what I was gonna do. So I sat and by hand, I turned the flywheel on that machine for every stitch of that dress. Just a little story there. Um, the, the little black workhorses are very portable and many are still running beautifully to the day. Mine was built in 1953. The most current sewing machines are likely computerized or electronic. They don't require sewing machine oil or any tinkering like was necessary with machines from not very long ago. They can be very expensive. One's newest sewing machine may also be an embroidery machine as well. Those are double the price. Many of today's quilters are still purists and wouldn't dream of machine piecing a quilt. They still cut every piece by hand and piece blocks by hand with needle and thread in their hand. As for me, I only machine piece. I have too many quilts living in my head, awaiting creativity. And at nearly 70 years old, I don't have enough time left on this earth to hand piece and quilt, but I sure applaud those who do. Of interest uh, is the photo on the right. There's a little backstory to that. The one on the left is a rail fence quilt that I made not very long ago, but on the right, is a quilt from the 50s and it was made for the little woman that you see in the bottom center in the plaid shirt. Her name is Phyllis and she was a kindergarten teacher in the school I worked in. And she had a sister and they were from Jefferson, New York. Phyllis's sister got married and not many years after she married, she died from a heart condition that she'd been born with. And the quilt that you see behind us was made for Phyllis's sister's wedding. It came back to Phyllis over the years and the thing is extremely heavy. It's got a wool batting inside. And anyway, Phyllis had it in her possession and as she's gotten her older, she was worried that something would happen to that beautiful old quilt and she would pass and nobody would know what to do about it. So I asked her if she wanted me to do a little research and see if I could get information about having it belong and preserved for time. And she said, yes. So I contacted the Methodist church in Jefferson and through their pastor and some ladies there, it was decided they would accept it as a gift from Phyllis and it would hang in the sanctuary. And this picture was taken, oh, just over a year ago when it was dedicated and Phyllis invited some of us close to her to go for that dedication. And it was a wonderful, wonderful moment. And it certainly made Phyllis happy and proud to know that quilt will be enjoyed by others for many years to come. During the 20th century, sadly, quilting saw much of a decline. During the 50s, Americans were more focused on progress, modernization, and mass production. Fast forward to the 2000s, and quilting has become more popular than ever, and than ever. And the art form has also become an amazing creativity. This, the quilt you see on the left, neither of these are mine. I only wish they were. The one on the left is all made from neckties. And the one on the right, called a stained glass quilt, is probably the most incredible one I have ever laid my eyes on. And it's made with blends of fabric to give it the appearance of light passing through it as would a stained glass window. Um, these are exquisite examples of the creativity that comes out of people's minds. One style of quilting is called crazy quilting. 
scrappy pieces of fabric are intentionally laid in many directions, overlapping one another and held in place with exquisite hand embroidery stitches. Often the lay of the fabric is random, yet other times it is intentional and determined. Items of beauty may also be incorporated, such as lace, buttons, faux jewels, feathers, ribbons, and so forth. Locally, an internationally well-known crazy quilter, Betty Pillsbury, is an, an excellent example of the creativity of this style. Her books share with us her creativity, passion, and the ways of crazy quilting. It is my pleasure to know Betty personally, and her creations are brilliant. Her Middleburg home is also her business called Green Spiral Herbs, where she creates products made with plants from her very own property. You can visit Betty's website at greenspiralherbs.com. Patchwork quilts are pieced together with small pieces of shaped fabric sewn to form the block. As you see in this example, this is the simplest form of a patchwork. Squares just cut from random fabrics and sewn together. A quilt like that, um, I don't know the size of that one, it's not mine, but I have seen them with one inch squares and they're called postage stamp patchwork. Pieces may be squares, but they also may be triangles, circles, stars, and many more. And the pattern designs would be cut from newspaper to be used repeatedly to try to ensure identical matching shapes. Multiple blocks are then formed into rows. Those rows of blocks are then sewn together to form the quilt top. There may be colorful or simple borders on the outer edges to frame in the piecework. Borders may be solid strips of fabric or they may be pieced intentionally from leftovers. To showcase their quilting skills, a quilter may create a sampler quilt. This would have many pieced blocks, each block very different from the other to show just how clever she was with needle and thread. She may also add squares of fabric folded and fashioned into a prairie point to embellish her, her quilt. Block names were derived many, many years ago. The log cabin block circa 1800 became popular during the Civil War times when log cabin quilts were made in auction to raise money for the troops. As you'll see here, the center square is generally red, representing the hearth of the home. The strips of fabric around the center square indicate the cabin's blocks. They're done in lights and darks to show the sunny and shady sides of the home. Some claim it is representative of happy and sad. Memory quilts became popular in the 80s, starting with the AIDS Memorial Quilt at a whopping 12 by 12 feet square, made from more than 40,000 pieces to represent the lives of those lost to AIDS. A memory quilt's purpose is to commemorate a life or lives. Another example of a quilt is a whole cloth quilt. Whole cloth quilts are neither pieced nor appliqued. Instead, the top is one solid piece of fabric generally white, although sometimes other colors are used. And the quilting is all done by hand with needle and thread to create an elaborate design all over that entire huge piece of fabric. And you can see here how um, intricate and, and fine the stitches are in so many places. Notice the scalloped border on the one on the right. That is a difficult thing to do. And the stitching along it is just amazing. And as um, historians, quilt historians, will often come upon a wonderful old quilt and they can tell from looking at it, studying it, they'll say there were eight different people who hand quilted there. They can tell from what section is different from another by the size of the stitches or the width of them. 
So I would imagine to have a beautiful whole cloth quilt like this, it would have been done by one person. Yo-yo quilts are made from small circles of fabric gathered and drawn into a circle, turned under, then stitched together. As you can see in these examples, it takes hundreds, hundreds of yo-yos to create even a small quilt. Sometimes they're used individually to embellish another sort of quilt. During World War I, the United States government encouraged making quilts for at-home use and that families save their blankets for our boys overseas. During the Great Depression, cloth feed and flower sacks were used to create quilts, clothing, and pillowcases. The chicken feed or the flower came in these great printed sacks. I still recall sleeping with a feed sack pillowcase on my pillow at my German grandmother's home in Pennsylvania. My favorite one was yellow roses on that buff colored um, feed sack. World War II saw signature quilts come into fashion. Businesses, individuals, and groups would participate. They would purchase a square of the fabric to have their names embroidered on it. Generally, they would sign it themselves with a pencil and then someone who embroidered would go over their signature with the, with the embroidery thread to create the um, fabric signature. Those blocks were then sewn together and the completed quilt was auctioned or raffled to raise money and given to the Red Cross. You can see an example on the right of a Red Cross. Of interest about modern fabric from the bolt is the symbols along the outer edge, which is called the selvage. The color dots tell a story about the fabric, including how many screenings that fabric has gone through. The dots indicate the individual colors used in the creation of the fabric, where the fabric was made, and the company that produced the fabric. The printing you see along there with like Robert Kaufman, that's the manufacturing company. Um, you got the notions that'll be the name of the line of fabric. And screen print D8291 means something to the fabric manufacturer. But if you go down to the third one, you can see that there are about, what are we talking about? about 18 different colored dots there. Each one of those indicates a different screening that the fabric went through and then each color that was used to create uh, the floral or print, whatever is on the, the fabric design. You may sometimes see um, a, a salvage edge that has two colors, red and white, because it's a red and white fabric. But then you may see one like this floral that has six, 10, 15 different screenings because it's very colorful and a lot more print in the fabric. The printing also is indica indicative of the repeat of the design in the fabric, which could be six inches or 12 inches. The repeat in fabric is very similar to the repeat in wallpaper. It's how many inches from the beginning of the design to the end of the completed design and where it starts again. Depending upon the intricacy and colorness of the fabric, these dots on the selvage could be many, but they're extremely handy to the quilter. She can cut that little swatch of fabric out of that um, selvage edge, take it with her to her favorite quilt shop, and those colors she can easily match from bolts in the quilt store. The textiles and fabrics used in America now are increasingly foreign created and clothing is made in other countries as well. During the 2010 census, it was re revealed that nearly 100% of apparel worn in the US is made elsewhere. And there were no looms made at that time. And fortunately, we are seeing more and more products made in the United States. In 2001, the American Quilt Barn Trail began in Adams County, Ohio. 
Donna Sue Groves wanted to honor her mother, Maxine, who was a, was a very accomplished quilter. And she wanted to do that by painting one of her mother's quilt squares on their barn. Well, as often happens, the person with the idea isn't the first one to get the product. It's often thought that the first barn quilt was on Donna Sue's barn, but in fact, there, it was an Ohio star created as part of a community celebration at a nearby herb farm. The Groves Farm later became part of the trail with their own block. There were 20 barn blocks in that trail, and it formed a driving th trail through Adams County. It became an emerging concept in the United States. It spread across Ohio and now includes barn quilts in Colorado, Georgia, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Maryland, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, South Carolina, North Dakota, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wisconsin. Also in Canada, British Columbia has developed a trail. Barn quilts also exist in Ontario and Kings County, New Brunswick. I am very proud to have been one of the grassroots members of the Schoharie County Quilt Barn Trail, which began in 2011 following Hurricane Irene. That is my block on the right, the Mariner's Compass. The Schoharie County Quilt Barn Trail um, it's a wonderful and powerful look at beautiful Schoharie County. Right here, this particular slide is of interest. The um, Tree of Life block is an eight foot block set on point on that red barn. And it was designed and painted by Ginny Miller Shaw. Ginny also owns the car below that barn. And about six years ago, I guess, maybe seven, she said to us in a quilt guild meeting, does anybody have any orphan blocks they don't want anymore? Hmm, some people didn't really understand what an orphan block is. Well, an orphan block is what a quilter would have left over. Say she made a quilt using 35 blocks, but she really only needed 34. So she's got an orphan left over. And over time, those accumulate and sometimes they get put into another quilt that is all orphan blocks, or they live in a box like I have. Um, so anyway, a bunch of us in Quilt Guild said to Jenny, sure, we had blocks she could have. So we donated, I have no idea how many blocks, I think there were like a hundred and some. And she crafted this wild and crazy car cover for her car. And when there are Schoharie County Quilt Barn Trail events, she will take her car to the event and then she pulls out this thing and straps it over her car. It's got a Velcro here and there and you lower the window and hook something the other place. And it is extremely clever and it gets a ton of attention. Well, the first time she had it out, we were in Middleburg, New York and I was in the village and she was over by the farm stands. And at some point, she left the farm stands to come over to the village where I was, and she left the car quilt on it. She got halfway across the bridge. The state police stopped her and told her she mustn't do that because they couldn't see her license plate. So the last I knew, she made a flap for the front and back that she can flip up so that her license plate is exposed. And each time, she, I think she's had two or three new vehicles since she made that. And she tells her husband, it has to be a car, the same shape, because she's not making it all over again. Before I leave you, I want to quickly take you through some photos of various quilt designs. The first one is called the churn dash. There are half square triangles and, and flying geese, geese with strips and a center square and all that used to make the block. For those who don't know what a half square triangle is, just look at the top left corner and you'll see that there's a white model triangle and below to the right is a brown printed triangle. That's one square made from two triangles. 
Thus, half of the square is a triangle and it gets the name half square triangle. You can create one of those simply by drawing a diagonal line on the back of that white fabric, cut it there, do the same on the brown and piece it together. There are, there are as many ways to make a half square triangle as there are quilt names. So that's just one and I'll share that with you. <clears throat> the Celtic square pattern is constructed with strips and squares. The sawtooth, the block is formed with squares, half square triangles, strips. The Baltimore album pattern, as I mentioned earlier, you can see in this one, it's made from 20 individual blocks, each one different from the other. It is all applique. Um, I don't know this, but I'm going to guess looking at the age of what it is. The colors sort of tell me it's old. Um, that would all be done by hand, as would be that exquisite scalloped and feathered border. And on the very outside order is hundreds of flying geese to form that edging. A cathedral windows is next, and that's made with squares and what's called an orange peel that little piece of orange peel slice that you see there. The Dresden plate pattern is next and it's made from blades cut from various different pieces of fabric. They're folded at the top, stitched across, turned right side out and the points are automatically made. Then the blades are stitched together. A circle is attached to the center so that the place where the blades come together is covered. And that would be probably hand applique on. The log cabin pattern, again, that center square being red depicts the hearth of the home. The strips are cut to sew on an outer edge, turn the block, sew the next one and so on. It's a very versatile block with many variations. The goose tracks pattern is a really fun one to make. You can see that it's triangles, squares, rectangles, and half square triangles that form the legs of the, um, well, actually the toes of the goose print. <clears throat> the sawtooth pattern, note that construction. Again, half square triangles for the corners, flying geese for the legs of the stars on each side, top and bottom. Then a square in a square completes the center. This is a, just a square in a square pattern. It can be turned so that it's um, diamond shaped and that's called on point. The star flower pattern, the outer corners are simple squares. The intersection is constructed of half square triangles, triangles, the star's legs are formed with either flying geese or more half square triangles. So this is indicative of how few spaces, few, few spaces, few shapes a person needs to know to be able to create a quilt. In closing, I would like to dedicate this moment to Helene Langan of Schoharie, New York. Helene passed away very unexpectedly last month at 86 years of young. She was a brilliant quilter, an Area Quilters Hall of Fame inductee, and a dear friend. I can only hope to be as lively and vital as Helene was at 86. In closing, I could go on for another hour or more with what I know and what I have learned researching for this presentation and what I have experienced with quilting. And that would only be the tip of the iceberg. My sincere thanks to the Sharon Historical Society for inviting me to speak tonight and to all of you folks who have joined us to learn more about the history of quilts and quilting. It was a pleasure to share what I do know and understand, and I hope you learned something new too. Thank you so much.
At this time, we'll open it up for questions and comments. Just type your question in the chat section at the bottom of your screen and Ron will moderate. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Sharon. That was a great uh, presentation. It really gave us a great insight to all the different types of uh, uh, quilt patterns and what you can do with them. Uh, let me see. Uh, these are going by pretty quickly, so I got to scroll back up. Um, Peggy asks, are you familiar with the Bethlehem Star Quilt from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania? I probably have seen it, and I may know it by a different name, but I'll write myself a note and Google it. The Bethlehem Star of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, Kate okay, said, I'll do that. Kate said it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, she especially loved that you covered the women of G's Bend. So I thought that was Thank great. you. Um, what, what do you recommend for a beginner in both in terms of patterns and a project, Kathy asks. Kathy, I would recommend for a first project that you take on something that's going to be usable and doable. And with that in mind, I would suggest something like a table mat or a placemat. Um, something that you're going to be able to handle and not frustrate yourself so that you don't want to carry on. I think a lot of people get in over their head in the beginning and it's so frustrating that they, they feel they'll never accomplish anything. So they've shot themselves in the shoe before they even get started. I would recommend something like that. Or there's a thing called a charm pack. And it's five inch squares that are pre-cut for you. Um, a lot of manufacturers have them, they're packaged up. Uh, you can simply just go to a Google a fabric charm pack and you'll get 50 hits probably. But those are precision cut to be identical. And they're five inch squares. Lay them out on your dining room table or a bed someplace large enough arrange them some way that you would think you would enjoy. However, let's say um, a charm pack will have 42 in it usually, 42 five inch squares. So lay it out five squares wide and five squares long. You've used just over that a half of that pack. Sew them together with a quarter inch seam and that is the ticket. Be sure you're using a quarter inch seam. Most presser feet on a sewing machine, the right leg of that presser foot is a quarter inch on most of them. But you can measure it with, with something. Sew that quarter inch seam very specifically and determinedly. Start slow, you'll get the hang of it, you'll get the feel of it. Sew those five squares across together in a row. Now do it to the next four rows below it. Now sew those five rows to each other and you're going to see something that makes you happy. It, is it going to be perfect? If you're really lucky, it is, but chances are it's not. If you've started and then you can go from there. I highly recommend reading um, anything you can get your hands on. If you can get to a library, um, online resources, if you go, if you can get to, um, you want me to start my video? All set. If you can get to YouTube, if you have a computer that you can get to YouTube, just type in that browser, start quilting or beginning quilting, and you will see so many wonderful videos to help you. I, I That's how I learned by reading books, asking my friends, joining a guild, um, never be scared to ask a question um, and quilters are some of the most giving people you'll ever want to meet they're happy to make for others they're happy to help you learn um, but I would start simply okay uh, there was a question early on there was a quilt that was 
looked like it was tatted or crocheted together, keeping the squares. That was about the sixth slide. I don't know. I remember that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know if that was tatting or? I would say it was probably crocheted, but I don't know. The fabrics in it looked a little more contemporary, and there's so few people that tat anymore. It could have been, but I, I'm going to guess it was crochet. Okay. But using thread, not yarn, very fine thread. Leslie said that uh, they have a quilt from the 1860s that's been passed down to, uh, you know, through the family. Any suggestions on someone who they could contact about quilt preservation. I know this has come up with the Sharon quilt, you know, what's the best way to preserve that? And uh, I don't know if you have, have gathered anything about quilt preservation. Um, I do know that sometimes they, you gotta be very careful when you hang an older quilt because of the weight and it, the fabric is old and, you know, can tear. So any thoughts on that? Do we know where this person is located? Can she tell us that? Uh, Leslie, I don't know if you can say where you're located. I don't have that. Uh, let's see. I... Casanova. Okay. Um, Leslie, you're not that far away from Schoharie, New York. If I were you, I would contact the Old Stone Fort in Schoharie. And I don't have their number handy, but you can find them online. And the Old Stone Fort has... I'm not sure how many, but I have seen them and there are a lot of very old quilts in their possession. And if they can't tweak you on to somebody who could help you with that, um, I, no, they would definitely be able to help you find somebody to help you with that question. Generally speaking, and you said it's from the 1860s. Um, there it is. Thank you, Kathy Slater. 518. 295-7192 for the Old Stone Fort. Um, generally, uh, quilt, uh, antique quilts will have tissue paper between it and whatever it's coming into contact with, and they're um, rolled rather than folded if possible, because folds will leave creases and it also... Um, causes the fabric to wear, you know, because we're talking about fabric that's a whole lot different than what we're used to today. Um, but another way that people uh, store their quilts, they get a long swimming pool noodle, those styrofoam like noodles, wrap it in fabric, then roll the quilt up lightly in that. Um, that's one way. Um, there are people who can date the fabrics that are used in that. I know the you said the fabrics from 18 or the quilts from 1860. Chances are that could be fabric older than that. There's people who that's what they do. They can tell by the dye, the colors, the feel of the fabric and so forth. But I would definitely contact the Old Stone Fort and see if they could give you some guidance or put you on to someone who could. They're a great resource. So Carla is asking if you know of any quilt shows that are scheduled locally, she would uh, like to uh, plan. I, and I do know that there's in Cooperstown that they do have the quilt shows. Uh, there's a quilt show, but I don't know the date on that. Well, I haven't received any information of live in-person quilt shows yet for this year. Um, due to COVID, a lot of them are doing virtual and so they have a, a video or they're going to do like this forum. They're going to have a, a Zoom or a virtual um, show. I don't know of any in-person ones. Our Quilt Guild had one planned for this spring and we had to can it. It's um, and, and because a quilt show is a massive amount of work and the people who would be putting it together would not want to take the risk of all that work and then COVID still keep us apart. So I don't really know of any that are live. Keep an eye out for um, Proctor's Theater in Schenectady. They have one every other year and it's a darn good show too. Um, but, and then there's the, um, 
New England uh, quilt show, and that's in Massachusetts, I think. Um, probably a Google search is going to be your your best guess, but um, due to COVID, our restrictions are still so tough that I doubt they're going to do any because um, you'd have to have limited numbers of people. And I'm telling you, hundreds and hundreds of people go to those big shows. And I see there's one down here. She says our guild also canceled our quilt show. That was for next January. So it, it, I can't. Uh, the short answer is I don't know of any at the moment, but there are some virtual ones that I've seen about. So there's a question and note asks if you uh, are familiar with the Tyler Woven quilts from around the 1800s. Tyler Woven? Uh-huh. I am not familiar. I'm going to write that one down too. Yeah, T-Y-L-E-R, Tyler Woven Quilts. Okay. I'll have to research that. Thank you. I always love to learn something new. Yeah. Well, that's all the questions that have come in. Uh, we really appreciate uh, everyone that's participated. Uh, I just want to let you know that our next program is How to Preserve Family Heirlooms. Uh, Kate Jackets is a uh, woman that does this for a living, and she will be giving a, an excellent uh, presentation on May 10th on how to preserve everything from photographs to uh, fabrics to, uh, you know, anything that's old. Uh, she'll give you some great tips on how to preserve those. We have quite a few upcoming presentations. Uh, here are some of the, the next ones coming up. Uh, we've got some very, very interesting ones. The history of ice cream. There's the story of the Statue of Liberty. Um, a Civil War diary. Uh, those of you that know Ted Short, he's uh, he'll be giving an excellent presentation. Those that are close to Sharon Springs know that Sharon Springs was a tremendous uh, uh, Hasidic Jewish community, and he's going to talk about what life was like in Sharon Springs as he was growing up. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of talk about the Adler Hotel here in Sharon Springs, so there will be a presentation from heyday to present day. Uh, Pete Lindem Lindemann is a, uh, uh, he works, he's an historian and uh, works for the Times Journal and has written lots and lots of uh, interesting articles about area history. So he's going to be talking uh, about some of those. Uh, we're going to be talking about the assassination of John F. Kennedy 58 years later. And then in December, uh, the history of Santa Claus. So very interesting. Um, those of you that would like to have more information about our mailing list, uh, get on our mailing list, or if you have questions, here's the information to reach out to us. And as I said, the um, this presentation will be recorded and will be available. All of you will receive a uh, an email with a link to that. And uh, I do apologize if there was a delay or a lag in the slides. Uh, they were, I have two computers and I was watching one and the one was right on time, but I was watching the second one and it was a lag. So I think there's an internet connection uh, lag and that's why they were late. So hopefully that didn't occur for too many people. But again, 